Welcome, fellow historical weirdos, to the super short audio thing that I slap onto the start of all my episodes. I'm recording this one during the last months of 2023, and Season 2 is officially underway! Season 2 promises to be just as commercial-free as Season 1, which means that if you want to support this show's continued existence, please consider becoming a patron of past peculiarity in exchange for a teeny monthly fee. Doing so will earn you your very own certified historical weirdo plastic medallion. Designed and 3D printed right here in the USA in an actual historian's living room, these medallions are collector's items and are shaped like actual circles. Run a pencil around the edge and draw as many chariot wheels, top-down views of grain silos, closed-mouth Pac-Mans, or out outside of yin-yangs as you'd like. And they come with an actual paper certificate with your actual name on it. Go to findyourselfinhistory.com slash sponsors to learn more. Subscriptions can be canceled at any time, but medallion and certificate are yours for life and to bequeath to future generations of confused descendants. Thanks, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome back to this electrifying new podcast about how history helps us make sense of the strangeness of now. Previously on You Are a Weirdo. Historically speaking, a single person asking a crowd to make some noise may be fairly new and weird. Colosseums and other amphitheaters throughout ancient Greece and Rome are still places where an orator's voice travels much further and more clearly than if that individual were talking in a normal outdoor space. Even the party poopingest of these scientists agreed that you could absolutely hear a seasoned actor or orator from all the way in the back. Gifted, disciplined speakers with access to additional technological tools can pull off other oratorical feats. Up until the 20th century, if you wanted some kind of physical tool to make your voice louder, and you didn't have an amphitheater nearby, you really just had one remaining option. Using some kind of cone-shaped voice loudening device. And these kinds of sound cones were not only found in Europe and around the Mediterranean Sea. Back in the Americas, at least one group of indigenous people also utilized a similar device. You want a nuanced, evidence-informed understanding of the historical context of innovations in audio amplification and related technologies? You can't handle a nuanced, evidence-informed understanding of the historical context of innovations in audio amplification and related technologies. In 1671, the mathematician and all-around smarty-pants guy named Samuel Moreland claimed to have used scientific principles to invent a new kind of amplification horn called the speaking trumpet. Pushing air harder through this kind of device was the only known way to amplify sound, at least until the invention of electronic amplification. Crafty inventors figured out that they could make louder noises using existing megaphone technology, but forcing more air through it with one of those newfangled electric motors. One of the best examples of this technology came in the form of the Victor Oxytophone. The fact that the ancient library of Alexandria had a whooshing air-based amplified instrument is a testament to how utterly erratic that so-called progress can be. Do you know what really happened to your great uncle on your mother's father's side? You killed him with your Oxyto sword. No, Captain Pulsar. I am your great uncle on your mother's father's side. No! Freaking! Way! Okay, I might have only dreamt a few of those flashbacks. But much of that summary was accurate. We were talking about ways of making one's voice louder prior to the invention of electronic amplification. So today we're continuing our bold journey into the loud by finally entering the electronic amplification age. And yeah, I get that continuing from a previous episode that first aired a couple weeks ago might make you feel like you're being strung along like a speaker cable. But you know what? It's going to be just fine. I'm a professional historian and I've been trained to metaphorically solder these two topics together. My name is Doug Sofer and I'm a weirdo. Just like you.
sad, sad people who have not yet heard this show? If so, please consider transforming them into happy, happy people by telling them all about it. And if you want me to be a happy, happy podcaster, head on over to findyourselfinhistory.com slash sponsors to learn about ways to support this one-of-a-kind history project. Electronic amplification changed everything. Sure, we said in our last episode that it's possible to use voice training, architecture, acoustic funnels, and even compressed air to make someone louder. But the electronic amplifier made this process cheaper and easier to implement. It's far simpler to regulate volume electronically, clarify the signal. It's superior in most ways to the technological solutions that had preceded it throughout the entirety of the human experience. Which is why this episode is called, You're Amped Up, Because You Are. Like, every day. Including, right now, listening to this podcast. And You Are a Weirdo, is the name of this podcast, so this might just be the best place on earth to think about how odd it was to have turned your volume dial to 11 for the first time. It was not, in fact, all that long ago. In terms of its mass adoption, it's really only about a century old. And it started with the invention of the triode. So if you're a humanities guy like me and your engineering and or physics chops are rusty, you might guess that a word composed of tri and ode might be referring to a three-part lyric poem. You'd have guessed wrong. It actually refers to an electronic device that has three electrodes. The triode was first made possible by putting those three electrodes in a specific configuration inside of a vacuum tube. Which leads us to our next question. Why would anyone in their right mind think that sucking the air out of a glass cylinder was a good idea? It was a good idea for the same reason that you suck the air out of an incandescent light bulb. Generally speaking, when you run an electrical charge through a thin exposed filament, it reacts with oxygen and combusts. The way to solve that problem is to suck the oxygen out, creating a vacuum, and possibly replacing it with some other gas that won't combust. In other words, the vacuum tube, the most important game-changing invention in the history of sound loudening, is the technological stepsister of the most important game-changing invention in the history of light brightening. At this point, I had been planning to introduce how vacuum tubes work by first describing how incandescent light bulbs function. I figured that'd be the simple way to begin, right? Annoyingly, that's not the case. A fact that's apparent from a 2015 Forbes magazine article entitled The Surprisingly Complicated Physics of a Light Bulb by a physicist at Union College named Chad Orzel. So like an incandescent light bulb that's been left on for a while, this topic is too hot to handle. And I'm not going to touch it. Let's just get to the vacuum tube instead. The first simple vacuum tube was invented all the way back in 1904 by a Brit named John Ambrose Fleming, who called it a thermionic valve. What actually happens inside these guys? Here's how it's described on a website managed by John Leinhard, Professor Emeritus in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Houston. In a vacuum, electrons flow from a heated element, like an incandescent lamp filament, to a cooler metal plate, he continues. The magic of the effect is that electrons can flow only from the hot element to the cool plate, but not the other way. The result of this temperature-based one-way flow is that the outgoing current of electrons is stronger than the incoming flow. It allows a weaker current to be converted to a stronger current. In other words, it strengthens, amplifies the flow of electrons by keeping them flowing in that one direction. In modern parlance, this thermionic valve is known as a diode, called that because it operates with two electrodes. In 1904, it became clear that you could use one of these suckers to convert weaker alternating current, AC, over to stronger direct current, DC. In 1906, based on that diode came the triode. U.S. inventor Lee DeForest invented it first as what he called a detector of radio waves that were passing by. It worked the same, except that the part through which the current flowed in one direction was surrounded by a grid, a kind of wire mesh that was itself powered with a separate battery charge. By changing the amount of power going to that grid, you can raise and lower the resistance to the current that's flowing through, which means that you can control the level of amplification of the electrical signal coming through the tube. DeForest called this new amplifying triode flavor of vacuum tube the audion. 
and it made it possible to have radio on a large scale, forever changing how human beings communicated with one another. It gave birth to multiple kinds of technologies that we now take for granted. Broadcasting networks, long-distance communication, the ability to amplify not just radio transmitters, but also radio receivers. For that reason, it was in the radio business where folks got most jazzed about tube amplifiers. Literally jazzed. The headline of an article in the Evening World newspaper out of New York City from May 1920 reads, Students dance to wireless jazz. University students at Pitt in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, dance to music transmitted by radio. The jazz in question was played by an orchestra at a concert hall at Carnegie Institute of Technology, today Carnegie Mellon University, a full half mile down the road. The amplification tech that allowed this long-distance music to be transmitted loudly enough was called the Magnavox, from Latin magna meaning great and vox meaning voice. The article explains that the Magnavox is an instrument which was used widely in military operations to increase the sound from a radio receiver. By 1920, then, nearly a decade and a half after the vacuum tube triode had first been patented, amplifying vacuum tubes and wireless radio started to accompany one another, like a couple of zany college students dancing with one another to the jazz. But this tech wasn't just useful for wireless radio. It turns out that those vacuum tubes could also work with wired systems to make all kinds of cool and loud noises, a fact which Lee DeForest made loud and clear to as many people as would listen. For example, back in 1915, the New York Times refers to the curious sounds that DeForest made in a demonstration to the scientific and tech community in the Big Apple. The headline, Men of Science See DeForest's Audion. Inventor demonstrates lamps musical possibilities to engineers. Again, they call the vacuum tube a lamp because that's pretty much what the closest tech was to it at the time. The article then adds an additional subheader. Made to sing as a bird. Wait, didn't we already talk about bird noises when we investigated early phonograph recordings in episode 3? Apparently, folks in the early history of audio tech started tweeting early. The Times describes the avian portion of DeForest's demonstration as follows. One of the sounds produced last night by the instrument very closely resembled the frightened calling of a lost chicken. I venture to say, said Mr. DeForest when he made his electric light perform this feat, that no musical instrument ever made sounds like that before. Actually, I've met trumpet players who can pull off some practically perfect poultry impressions with their horns. But sure, DeForest was definitely showing off something innovative here. So to sum up what we've learned so far, by the end of the first decade of the 20th century, we've got all the electronic components that we need to build a global network of radio signals. We can even plug them in and make some bird noises. By the middle of the 1920s, all of these technologies would come together and make PA, public address systems, commonplace. Let's trace the paths of those wires and we'll discover how electrically juicing up volume altered speakers, both the electronic and human sort. That Magnavox loudspeaker we mentioned earlier capitalized on the triode vacuum tube and made the rapid expansion of PA loudspeaker systems possible. In May 1915, two inventors originally from Denmark, Edwin Pridham and Peter Jensen, set up shop in Central California. The friendly, presumably wine-imbibing folks at the Napa County Historical Society in California describe Pridham and Jensen's first test. After accidentally creating a loud eruption of feedback that sounded like a gunshot, much to their neighbors' dismay, they got the system working and tested it by blasting out the following insightful words to their community. Hello, Sacramento. Hello, Sacramento. Can you hear me? How is my voice coming in? Do you hear me clearly and distinctly? Hello, Sacramento. If you can hear me, start your bonfire. Or at least it would have sounded exactly like that, if I had even the slightest clue on how to do a Danish-American California accent from the mid-19-teens which I do not. 
Anyway, you might think that the people of Sacramento would start freaking out hearing this thunderous loudspeaker tech for the very first time in human history. But they didn't. Instead, folks within hearing range ran to their telephones and called this dynamic duo of deafening Danish dudes, requesting that they play music. So why didn't this new loudspeaker cause more of an uproar? After all, this tech was definitely new, and still a work in progress. In fact, over the next years, scientists, engineers, inventors, and tech journalists alike constantly played around with new applications for this thing, new ways to use the Magnavox to broadcast loud sounds far and wide, all the while Pridham and Jensen and others at their new company, also called Magnavox, kept refining their systems. For example, the Washington Times newspaper of April 21, 1919, describes the demonstration of the Magnavox. The headline reads, Crowd hears lone speech from plane high in sky. And it begins, A brand new scientific invention, the Magnavox, was pressed into service for the first time today, the opening day of the drive for the Victory Liberty Loan. And the reporter claims that, 10,000 persons cheered as the plane flew 3,000 feet above the crowd. By this point, the Magnavox had been improved and modified so that it could filter out extraneous noises, even from the extremely loud airplane engine in the cockpit of the plane. And the tech kept on improving. The introduction to a 1924 college textbook called Purposive Speaking describes how important it is for a public orator to think carefully about the differences between making a public speech and making simple conversation. It counsels that the further away you are from your audience, the louder you need to speak. A speechmaker has to sacrifice subtlety in order to be sufficiently loud. But then the author adds a line that did not appear in previously published books on this topic. It says of a would-be orator, Suppose he is talking over the radio, or suppose that his audience chamber is equipped with audion bulb amplifiers. Then these distinctions fail. By 1926, the London-based Wireless World, a magazine for radio professionals and hobbyists, features an article describing how the historic church building in the English city of Bath had been recently wired for sound amplification. When the pious men built the ancient Abbey of Bath, either the question of acoustics did not come up for consideration, or clerical lungs were tougher than they are today. The church leaders installed a new Marconi phone public address system, built by the company founded and named after the father of the radio, Guglielmo Marconi of Italy. The system included an amplifier, a switchboard, multiple microphones, and a network of loudspeakers that reached part of the buildings that had been so-called dead zones up until this audio engineering project had been added. The article's author praises how the equipment looks sufficiently classy to complement the sacred decor and adds, The church authorities are to be congratulated on the progressive spirit which has prompted them to take advantage of modern scientific methods to make the service audible to every member of the congregation. And amped-up voices weren't only to be found urging people to buy bonds, or on public stages, or airplanes, or in churches. They were also used to yell at workers. I mean, inspire employees. A News in Brief micro-article from a 1926 Wireless World cites an Australian businessman who studied business practices in the United States and concluded, The installation of loudspeakers in American factories and workshops has increased production by 20%. So these systems were showing up in people's workplaces, too, by 1926. And in yet another issue of Wireless World from that year, there is a photo of the U.S. Assistant Secretary of War, Hanford McNider, making a speech to the entire large crowd of cadets at West Point Military Academy. The photo caption is especially useful for what we're trying to do here. The use of loudspeakers and amplifiers for public speaking has practically ceased to arouse comment in America, where these benefits are taken as a matter of course. I've thrown this photo and caption onto this episode's page at findyourselfinhistory.com if you'd like to see it. Either way, it's these kinds of moments when a phenomenon that had once been understood as novel becomes part of normal, everyday life. That's what this podcast is all about. 
It's where the different ingredients that make up the strangeness of now come into being. When I first decided to take on the question of loudspeaker tech for this episode, I expected to find more documentary evidence of people who were disturbed at how weird it was to hear all of these new super-loud human voices thundering everywhere all around them. But history is an evidence-based discipline, meaning that just because we want to find something in the past doesn't mean it's there. History is full of surprises, and what I found on this topic surprised me. I expected the people in Sacramento who first heard Pridham and Jensen's voices to go nuts. I figured they'd sprint away from the noise up to the grapevine festooned hills, trample all those Cabernet Sauvignon grapes, and maybe I'd find references to the great grape juice waterfall of 1915 or something. But no. Fortunately, for both the humans and the grapes, that's not how it went down at all. Contrast that calm reception to early loudspeakers to the reactions of the first people to listen to a recorded voice for the first time ever. I talked in the third episode of this podcast about the popular reception of Thomas Edison's phonograph, invented in 1877. People who heard one of those for the first time grasped just how bizarre, how new and foreign to all prior human experience that particular technology was. And the phonograph's invention had come out of many earlier experiments from the tail end of the 18th century through the early 19th century, and with the pace of invention accelerating into the 1870s. Alexander Graham Bell's 1876 patent for the telephone had preceded Edison's phonograph by a year, and Bell's work had built off of many prior experiments with vibrations and electricity. His practical version of the telephone would not have been possible without many, many other scientists and engineers who had worked out similar, though less reliable, telephone and telephone-like technologies in the many decades leading up to the 1870s. And many of those technologies came out of the increased experimentation with the telegraph, whose so-called forgotten father built a wired signaling system all the way back in 1823. I talk about that development in episode 5, by the way. The point is that the wide-scale adoption of all of these technologies had already changed the world by the first decades of the 1900s. And again, that pace had accelerated. Inventors like Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, Lee DeForest, Edwin Pridham, Peter Jensen, Edouard Branly, Nikola Tesla, Guillermo Marconi, and dozens of other inventors had become famous, often rich too, during their lifetimes. And for each well-known inventor, there were at least tens of thousands of other inventive people, hobbyists and professionals alike, who worked in laboratories or explored practical applications of these technologies, or read, subscribed to, and wrote letters to tech publications, or joined like-minded communities of fellow AV nerds. They hailed from all over the globe, basically all over the industrialized world, including Western Europe and the United States but also Eastern Europe and Japan. So by the time of that 1915 Napa loudspeaker experiment, Americans, and many others around many parts of the Earth, had been long accustomed to new inventions and discoveries that manipulated sound in many new ways. And that's not even to talk about dynamite, automobiles, airplanes, motion pictures, or a million other factory-made inventions that changed everyday life at an accelerated pace from the second half of the 19th century to the 1920s and beyond. It seems, then, that the thundering sound of the loudspeaker-driven PA system had already had some of its thunder stolen from it by the time these amplifiers first went live. The idea of new technologies had become old. Let's think about the implications of that fact as we start to wrap up this episode. Electronic amplification blasted out into the world, riding an enormous wave of innovation and invention that came out of the late 19th century and early 20th century. But unlike the inside of those triode tubes, these technologies did not emerge out of a vacuum. Sure, all the inventors we've discussed so far were clever people. But the increased frequency of invention during this era involved so much more than just being clever. A lot of that frequency came about because of industrialization, a period called the Second Industrial Revolution, 
After all, even though these inventors came from many parts of the globe, pretty much all of these individuals came from, or at least lived most of their lives, in countries with industrial economies. This wave of inventions emerged out of an industrial era that witnessed a complex interconnected array of social and intellectual trends. New ways of thinking, new concepts for conceiving of society, government, economics, and the role of the individual, even religion and the arts. Governments and business owners organized their entire countries around the production of manufactured goods in powered-up factories, with conveyor belts and machinery and easy-to-replace workers, whose owners attempted to maximize efficiency of production and optimize profit. And this big factory-based system helps explain why the pace of invention broke into a flat-out sprint during this age. But unlike the one-way electrons in those triode vacuum tubes, innovation during this era had become a two-way process. Going one way, factory owners, assembly line workers, and tech employees all worked for increasingly enormous companies to prototype, perfect, and mass-produce new audio devices like the Audion Amplifier, the Magnavox PA system, and the many technologies that came after. At the same time, heading in the other direction, these same audio technologies were used by industrialists to market their products, to communicate by wired telephones or wireless radio with one another, to use loudspeakers in order to increase production within the factories themselves. At the end of the day, the increased frequency of technological innovation, invention, and scientific discoveries during this era came out of, and perpetuated, a kind of feedback loop. New technologies, including those of sound amplification, led to other technologies, creating a situation in which innovation itself became almost expected. We're still living in that strange new world of accelerated technological transformation today. It's our normal as well. And even though the early 20th century seems like a long time ago, in the big picture of the human experience, it's still recent. Now compare that fact to the conclusion of the previous episode. The revelation that for thousands of years technological change had occurred only in fits and starts that basic pipe organ design had been around for literally thousands of years, that for multiple millennia, your best bet for amplifying sound was to make a cone or build an amphitheater. The contrast is one more indication that our current breakneck pace of innovation is brand spanking new. Understanding that newness, gaining that temporal perspective, may be the main reason that studying history is vital to comprehending the peculiar world in which we find ourselves today. Next time. You may have noticed by now that I keep saying that I've wanted to talk specifically about the relationship between audio technology and dictatorships. But I keep getting caught up with the tech side of the conversation, partly because there's a lot to understand, and partly because it's a lot of fun to read about and discuss. But we still need to answer that initial question. How did the use of amplification technology allow political leaders to appear larger than life during the early age of sound amplification? That's next time again. Will this be an actual trilogy? Or will it end up as a five-ish or six-ish part trilogy like The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Or maybe like Isaac Asimov's seven-book foundation trilogy? Stay tuned and find out. You may find the references to the historical sources, sound files, and other information used for this and other episodes at findyourselfinhistory.com. If you've got insights or observations or questions about this episode or about any aspect of this podcast, feel free to lob an email in my general direction at doug at findyourselfinhistory.com. Special thanks to Professor of Computer Science Robert Lowe from Southeast Missouri State University for helping a simple country historian and all-around humanities guy like me better understand how vacuum tubes work. Note that if I screwed up any of that part, it's because I didn't paraphrase his explanation well enough, and I take full responsibility for those errors. Please do not send Bob angry emails. At least not for that reason. Bob and I used to frequently eat lunch together at Maryville College, a place so close to the Great Smoky Mountains that you can see them right from campus on a marginally clear day, or better. Maryville College, every day unexpected, 
Learn more at maryvillecollege.edu. Opinions expressed in this podcast are mine alone and do not necessarily reflect those of Maryville College, its administration, faculty, staff, students, board of directors, or sentient vacuum tube-powered robots lurking in the basement of Thaw Hall. This podcast episode was researched, written, edited, narrated, recorded, and mixed by Doug Sofer. All materials are copyright 2023 Doug Sofer. The theme song was written and performed by Doug Sofer with Matt Trimbley on rhythm guitar. Find out more about Matt at Trimbley.com. Thank you so much for listening.